Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, well, welcome to this talk. Um, this is a joint work with the machine learning group at ETH Zurich with a student we shared with Joachim Buhmann. His name is Sasha Vesnevets. So this talk is about semantic segmentation and the task as laid out in recent years, mainly by, uh, by the seminal work on text boost by Jamie Shotton, is the following. You have an image and you want to label every single pixel with a semantic label out of a closed set that's given to you. So here it would be sky, tree, building, car, and so on. So this is a task of simultaneous recognition and segmentation of the objects. There are countless applications which I'm not going to recap. So the, the, the big difficulty is that there's a great appearance variation between different instances of a class. So here you can see uh, the, all the different types of grass or trees that you can get, the different types of cars that you can get. And a core observation that will drive the motivation for this work is that no single visual cue can distinguish between classes. Maybe with color you can tell apart water from grass, but with color alone, grass and trees don't come out so well, you would need texture. And for some other classes, such as uh, buildings, uh, it's much more about the special layout of, of local corner-like features that, that would give you uh, the meaning. And um, you will have to be successful to put together a lot of different uh, visual features. A brief review for those not too familiar with this field. Um, and the field um, exists since a long time, but let's say a lot of interest started to gather basically in 2006 with, with text and boost, and a number of work followed that format. The basic format of, on, the basic model that with which you try to tackle this problem is a pairwise CRF, where every pixel in the image becomes a node. You have unary potentials that are basically multi-class appearance classifiers that take some patch around the pixel and try to predict one of the semantic classes. And then you have some pairwise potential that tries to enforce label smoothness within the image. So this is an oversimplification, but that's uh, a, a fair representation of, a, of the basic model. Um, at the beginning, um, uh, with, with text on boost, there were uh, only a few uh, features and only a pairwise model. But later works that today achieve the state of the art, such as those uh, in Filtor's group, um, they move to have a lot more features and a more complicated uh, structures such as higher order potentials which allow you to capture statistical dependencies which you cannot model with just pairwise potentials. Then there is another kind of family of works which is kind of emerged only in the last few years, non-parametric methods very much in the, I would say, um, Toral by Nefros type of school of thought. Um, the famous award-winning work in, in 2009 was trying to align training images with global descriptors and sift flow to the query image and then using this uh, um, scene flow map to transfer the labels directly. And that was a, a, an interesting alternative approach. Um, but it tends to need a lot more training images to work. And that's why people moved to more complicated data sets recently, which we will see makes a big difference. And possibly the state of the art today, um, Love Lab Next Super Parsing, who takes the idea of non-parametric to the limit, basically describing super pixels in the training images comparing the, descript the super pixel descriptor to the test, and if it matches, you can transfer the label directly. Of course, you need some refinement with a, a CRF afterwards, but the core spirit is there. I highlight once again, state of the art work, tons of figures. This is a table I took from her paper, and at the beginning I was laughing, thinking, man, it's getting really complicated. But then she put the source code online, and I was emailing her, thanking her, that I don't have to redo all this. We are talking about 3,000 different features here. Um, Semantic segmentation in most um, uh, works that appear so far is tackled in the fully supervised scenario, which means for training, you are given um, fully labeled pixel maps where every, every pixel is labeled with its class. And instead, in this work, we want to tackle it in the weekly supervised setting, which means instead of a pixel, uh, a label per pixel, you only have a set of all the labels that will appear in the image, but you have no idea where. So I argue this is an interesting scenario because reducing the level of supervision uh, will allow you, uh, at least in theory, to scale to a very large number of training images and many more classes. Um, the fact is that if you start to do it weekly supervised, the problem becomes much harder, as we will see, 
but in particular, as we will see, it becomes difficult to integrate multiple visual cues because it is difficult to learn the weights between the cues without a reference ground truth. And in fact, that's the main contribution of this work. We will see how to do weekly supervised structured output learning. And here is some um, build up of the model because it's a complicated model. I thought it's a lot more fun to build it together progressively, slide by slide, instead of dumping all the bubbles and arrows. What is the simplest thing you could do for weekly supervised semantic segmentation? The task is you are given this bunch of training images with labels, but no pixel level labels. You want to recover appearance models, which um, are able to, to classify or at least predict probabilistically a label for every uh, super pixel in the image, and the, image, uh, the super pixel labeling in image i and super pixel j. So the simplest thing you could do is to um, define um, observed nodes which contain the superpixel features, the gray. Here are the superpixels we use, which come from the famous work of Felsenhoff in 2004. Then you would have also observed nodes, Y, which contain the image level labels you are given by the supervision. Then you would have latent, labels that, uh, latent variables that are the most interesting part of the model, which you want to recover, which are the superpixel labels, which you cannot observe. And then you start plugging in classic unary potentials um, that connect the latent superpixels able to the observed superpixel features um, at the beginning. So these unary potentials are the output of a, a superpixel classifier, theta, which you do not have at the beginning. That's part of the learning. You've got to get it. But if you had it, ideally, it would look like this for three. And then you have, would have another unary potential, which is a degenerate one, which is basically uh, giving um, an OK if a superpixel label takes uh, the label from the image and infinite cost if it doesn't. So this uh, encodes the image constraints, the image label constraints. So this is the simplest thing you could do. It's really the least modeling. There is no spatial relations. It's just a big bag of segments. But if you do that, you could imagine solving this, solving for y and theta by a modification of k-means, basically, where the mean operation would be trained appearance models and the assignment operation will be assigned super pixels to the closest appearance model. So you could run that, hope that it gets into some good local minima, and it would do something, but not very well. In fact, you are not modeling all the dependencies in the data, especially the special one, and more importantly from our viewpoint, uh, this energy function will be completely unregularized. So any labeling that fulfills the um, image label constraints will be equally valid. There is no reasoning that would tell you this labeling um, would be preferable over the other. And that's, as we see, will overfit a lot. So one thing you can start doing then, like um, every, every fully supervised model has this since 2006 at least, is to have pairwise potentials within one image. So for example here, the super pixel will be connected to all this adjacent, and the pairwise potential would say, oh, you are fine, zero energy, if two adjacent super pixels stay the same label, or pay a penalty proportional to the difference in appearance between the two super pixels. So that's a classic. Um, and basically gradient weighted uh, pairwise. And you can see this encourage label smoothness within an image and can see as a regularization term over the space of labels. So again, this was in fully supervised methods since forever, but not in wicked supervised ones. So here is a new term. This is a fun new term. Why stopping a pairwise potential within a single image? The concept can be extended between multiple images. You can now say, Let's put the same, the same function, the same function phi, this time connecting two super pixels between different images. You can say two super pixels between different images that share a label. If they share a label and they are similar, the super pixels, then they are more likely to have the same label. So in fact, this is the same form as this potential, but now there are many more of them, and they connect super pixels between images. So this will introduce OK, good. PowerPoint was thinking about the concept. Good, he's getting it. So of course, this is easy to say, and I think we all agree it would be a good thing to do. It would introduce even more regularization in the label space. It would transfer information between images. Certainly a good idea, but isn't it too expensive, Vito? There are a lot of pairwise connections. So in fact, we can take advantage of the fact that this equation uh, goes to 0 no matter which labels if two super pixels have a big appearance dissimilarity. If they're very dissimilar, no matter which labeling, they're going to say, yeah, you're fine. Do whatever you want, energy zero. And so you can exploit that to, make, uh, to build a random field in a data-driven manner. You can say, let's now um, look only at pairs of images that share a label anyway. That's the only thing we do. 
And then if, uh, so, so if two superpixels have a large dissimilarity, we do not put the edge in the graph. So that leads naturally to a, to a data-driven sparseness, which in fact, uh, it's, a, it's, it, it's a small approximation to the total field. <coughs> so for those of you that are more theoretically minded, you can start thinking, why do this pairwise potential between image make sense? In fact, you can think that in appearance space, um, the superpixels of one class um, between images are shareable, label, they form some manifold of connection, which you can represent with this nearest neighbor graph. And in fact, what we are doing is introducing a potential which penalizes labelings that cut through the manifold and break it, which um, at this point, if you see it this way, you see it makes sense and you see that it becomes a regularizer for the labeling. So now, we got to the multi-image model. This is basically what we had at ICCV 2011. Then we'll see the, the delta we made. Uh, again, we want to recover the appearance model theta and the superpixels label Y. Jointly, gets pretty mad, it mixed integer program for most appearance models. But fortunately, you can do alternative minimization to get in a reasonable local optima. You can fix the labeling. For example, you start with a random labeling. That's what we do. Random respecting image constraints, obviously. Image labeling. Then from there, if you fix the labeling, learning the appearance models is a supervised learning problem. And for most appearance models, you can do it very easily. Like, say, it's a random forest. Say, it's a linear SVM. Easy. Then once you fix the appearance models, you can infer um, the latent superpixel labels with alpha expansion. This is a multi-label problem where all pairs potentials are submodular. So you can do something reasonable if, um, you know, if you set down this model. So what is missing in this model? Well, I started a talk motivating multiple features. Where are they? Right? Where are they? they? They are going to come. They are coming here in the missing term. What is missing is that if we want multiple appearance models on the pairwise potentials, and in our model, that's the most important because that's what carries this regularization effect. We will need weights to trade off the relative importance. And as, so, as we have many, many of them, say 10, it's very difficult to set them by hand. So you start to need to have an alpha vector that weights the importance between the unary and the pairwise and weights the difference pairwises together. So each pairwise potential introduces another set of edges and carries another dissimilarity measure, color, shift, text, and gist, whatever. So now, if I give you alpha, you know what to do to get to a good approximation. You do the alternating optimization I described before. But how do we pick alpha? That's the core concept of this talk. It's very hard to pick alpha in a traditional manner. If you try to minimize this energy over y, alpha, and theta, with some monster magic, godlike uh, optimizer that manages to do it even, then it will just set alpha zero equal one and switch off all the pervers potentials. This is a classical effect. If you ask a function herself, how much do you want to be regularized? It will say, please don't regularize me. Same effect you get in SVMs if you ask the training data, what should be C? Without a proper validation, it's at C to zero. Well, to infinity. Um, that's the first barrier. The second barrier will tell me, well, man, just to uh, standard cross-validation like things or do structured output learning with, uh, you know, um, with like uh, structured SVMs methods. Uh, the problem is I cannot even define a loss on this problem. Um, I don't have any ground truth training data at the pixel level. So I cannot do the traditional uh, structural output learning. I cannot even define a loss between how good the labeling is. Uh, I don't know how good the labeling is. It is just no, no clue. So here we need something else because we want to set those weights but we cannot set them without the ground truth in a traditional manner. So how to set weights without the ground truth? First of all, you need a cost function that will prefer a weighting over another. Then we have to optimize it. What is a better weighting once you have no ground truth? Well, we argue there is a way to at least determine what is a better weighting over an arbitrary weighting. And this is the following concept, which we call expected agreement. We start by... Uh, evaluate. So this expected agreement is a function that evaluates a weighting alpha. And we start by splitting the training set into two subsets, as in classic cross-validation. Then we can run, so because alpha is given, because we are trying to evaluate it, you can run the weekly supervised uh, learning method that will give you a labeling and a theta, a set of parameters, on this subset. Now, you can take the second training set and apply the parameters you learned, pretend that the second training set is a test set. You discard the image level labels, throw them away, pretend it's a test set, run your parameters, and you get the labeling. So far, so good. Now you do the same thing in the other direction. You take the second training set, you do weekly supervised learning, get the labeling and a theta, 
and apply it to the first training set. And at this first training set, for a moment, you pretend it's a test set, and you run it. So now you get two labelings for each of the two training sets. Now you can ask, do they agree? Are these two labelings in agreement? So if they are in agreement, we argue this is a better set of alpha. So an alpha is good if it leads to pixel labeling and parameters that agree on a second part of the training set. So why is this a good idea? Because it's basically, it's basically tries to check if the parameters generalize in the generalized sense without the ground truth. So do they agree on the other side? And the number of experiments to show that in fact as expected parameter agreement grows, the, ground, the quality of the pixel level labeling goes up. So the problem with this, I mean, um, this is maybe a meaningful criterion, we hope, um, and it doesn't need ground truth. The problem with it is it's a very big, uh, arbitrarily shaped criterion. So it doesn't have a, a very nice form that you could derive, for example, to do gradient descent. It, in fact, has no analytic gradient. And it's typically a seven to 10 dimensional, uh, the space in which alpha lives, depending on your uh, number of features you want to use. And it's definitely, uh, the criterion is not convex at all. More important than maybe the fun part of the work, evaluating one alpha is very expensive in the order of minutes. If I ask you one alpha, you gotta go through the trouble of running the whole weekly supervised learning on the training sets twice. And each of them involves multiple retraining of the PDS models and multiple alpha expansions on the whole training set. So you want to evaluate alpha rarely, if possible. So what do we do to get out of this? Do we give up on having weekly supervised trend weights? No, no, we really want them. We really wanted to, to get them, absolutely. So we stumbled over a reas reasonably new uh, optimization techniques, popular in, more in the machine learning the literature, which is so-called black box optimization with Gaussian processes. So Gaussian processes are well known for regression and at least less well known for classification, but still. And you can exploit the properties, um, the smoothing properties of Gaussian process regression to derive a global optimizer. This is not our idea. This we picked from uh, Srinivasan and ICML 2010. And before him, since basically 2007, people are playing with these things. Um, and how does it work? So the crucial point is that it only needs to evaluate the function. It doesn't need derivatives or other things. So what do you do? You, you start by querying the function a of alpha at a small number of points. In our case, two. Less than that, it didn't sound reasonable. And you fit a um, Gaussian processor regressor. Let's say it looks like this. The crosses are the evaluated points, and the continuous line is the mean of the Gaussian process. But more importantly, the gray shaded area is, uh, is basically two standard deviations of the Gaussian that the Gaussian process fits on the vertical, on the output space. So now, instead of just looking, for, looking near the point of the, nearest, uh, of the highest peak you have so far, you can ask, what is the next point I should evaluate? Very expensive, you want to evaluate few. And so the idea of Srinas and others is to ask for the point that satisfies the maximum of this equation, which is take the mean of the Grosjean process plus, uh, um, as, um, plus its standard deviation multiplied by some scalar beta. So basically, you are going to evaluate the point which has, holds the largest promise. You don't know how big the function is there, but in this point, there is the largest promise, upper bound possible value in which the function can go. And why is this good? Because it trades off exploration with exploitation. If you have a few uh, regions of this alpha space that you did not evaluate a lot, or you did evaluate a lot, but it's heavily rugged, the curvature is big, then it will start to evaluate more there. Try to probe there to see if the function can go very high. If you have a part that you evaluated um, a lot, but it tends to, you know, to have shown a local maxima, the Gaussian process will see it and will not give it a high, um, a, a high covariance of the output, so you will not evaluate there. And it nicely can jump in and out of local maxima with this very simple rule. You don't need to define any complicated rule, just go to the maximum of this. Okay, um, as we will see in the experiments, with this process we are able to, uh, well, the process converges after about 100 alpha evaluations in seven dimensions, and will lead to results which are equivalent to doing an exhaustive grid search with 10,000 points in seven dimensions, so it's 100 times faster. It's very useful. So, this was the main contribution of the work, how to set the weights in weekly supervised manner. So we rush through um, the other parts which are more standard. Once you have trained your theta and obtained your Y labelings, how do you label a new test image? Well, you could just apply the theta parameters and label every super pixels, but this would mean we throw away the big lessons from um, the non-parametric methods. And in fact, we managed to fuse the two in this model. 
you can take a test image and retrieve the most similar, globally similar training images by some gift or so. And now you can take a histogram of the image level labels of the training that are most similar and use this as a prior, um, uh, use this as a soft version of the um, image level labels at the test image. And that just replaces the standard unary potential and drives um, the labeling to respect this histogram. Then you can plug your test image inside the multi-image model we had. So this is basically the training images. They no longer have fairwise potential anymore and they are all fully observed because after training we fix the super pixel labels. Now you can plug the test image in the middle and connect the, the super pixels that are similar between the training and the test and carry the usual uh, pairwise potential we described before. So in this manner you get a hybrid between a purely data-driven method, which is just copy-pasting labels, and a, a parameterized method, which uses the theta appearance potentials in one simple and unified model. Um, maybe I'll just skip through this because it's not so important. We talked about pairwise potentials that contain multiple features. But what about the unaries? They also need to contain multiple features. Otherwise, what are we doing? And the way we do that is by um, very rapidly, is by extremely randomized dashing forest. But um, in the interest of time, um, I think I skip over this part. Um, I want to insist that we have really a lot of features in order to get it to work. We downloaded L Lana's code. Um, and uh, it's really amazing what people are trying these days. Not just features inside a superpixel, but even blow the superpixel up by dilation and recompute features because somehow this captures boundary. And, and that's Lana argues in a RCV10 paper, this brings a, quite a difference to so use all these tiny different features. And what is good in this work is that we can use them in a weekly supervised setting. So here are some results. We will show results on the label mis flow subset, which is first introduced by uh, Toralba and his students in 2009 in the award-winning paper. This is more interesting than MSRC, in my opinion, because it's recent, so it has 10 times more data, basically. We are now at 2,500 training images, 200 test images, and a lot more classes. A lot more classes is important, because as we will see, the difficulty of, uh, of a, uh, like Rob also argued, a difficulty of a data set depends also on the, um, um, let's say, power law distribution on the, on, the, on the presence of certain classes. So you have a lot of sky, a lot of grass, but very few windows and mice and little objects. So that's very interesting. When you have many classes, you can um, check those phenomena. Like, there is even a moon class. Like, not many classes with moons. Um, here are some qualitative results at the end of our full pipeline. You can see the original image, it's ground truth, the output of our method, and the output of super parsing, which according to us is the best fully supervised methods these days. So this one inputs training pixel level labels. Ours inputs only for training image level labels. And when it works well, they both work reasonably uh, well. But there are uh, cases in which uh, we screw it up pretty bad. For example, this culture in front of the building, it's labeled as a tree, which is beyond me, given that it's gray. Um, in general, the fully supervised version is it's more accurate. You can see also here it, it, it got some elements of the road. But uh, they are quite comparable, as we see also numerically. If you look at it in numbers, we can measure average per class accuracy. So this means that for every single of the 33 classes, you measure what is the percentage of pixels you labeled correctly. This is different than total pixel level accuracy, which is a lot easier, which you can solve to a good degree by predicting everything is sky, grass, and road. Yes, David? So it's a very good comment, in fact. Um, there, are two, there are many issues. Like One issue is what you say. Within a single class, uh, some pixels are more valuable than others. But between classes, even, in some images, a cut is very important. And in the other image, the cut is just strolling by. If it's an image of your cut, you don't want to miss the tail of the cut. If it's an image of a city with a cut strolling, you don't care. So in fact, our measurements are what they are, given the ground truth. And we are yet to define a protocol which will satisfactorily determine if it's useful for an application. However, 
in terms of pure scientific challenge, if you want to know, did you label the pixels correctly? At least this is a measure that gives some indication. But there, there is a pre perfectly good measure, which is basically boundary measure, right? BST, uh, BST, uh, uh, the vertical discrimination measure. Mm -hmm. That if you actually, that's the, yeah, that's the issue with all of the semantic uh, words, that if you actually apply plug in that measure, the ordering of the methods changes completely. Okay. Right, so, and, and one, at least one should do both measures in all the papers, I think. And, and, and one, I would argue that the boundary measure makes much more sense because of what David said. Okay, so I believe that this is also a good suggestion, but I believe it's a suggestion that's different from David's. David was arguing about, I believe at least my understanding, that some um, sub-portion of that class in that image is useful because it gives you application-driven information to turn left. Whereas you argue the boundary is more important because it leads to the accuracy of your segmentation. They're both useful suggestions, but I don't think they're the same suggestion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I did not make this <coughs> and it's not purely application driven. I'm saying that some, it's much more important to get some pixels right than others. That some pixels are so agonizingly obvious, it's just silly to count. But, but those are the boundary pixels usually. What, the, 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 pixels the, the, the useful ones. Pixels. Because that's, that's where you stop being a road and be, no, start sorry, being a no, ditch. No. Is it so those bits? So this paper is not completely modified. The, I wrapped it with a geometric distortion. One, one of the annoying things about looking along a road oh, I see, is you get the right. your boundary right close to you. It's right. 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 The bit you care about is the boundary well ahead of you. And it might be really quite small. But when you, if you miss that small group of pixels, the fact that you can turn left is missing. This is a tiny bunch of now, there are all sorts of other things you could argue about, about pixel level loss, but they seem really bad. Okay, so um, in defense of these protocols, at least, you know, certainly having such a level of labeling, the one of Alios has the advantage that it's defined objectively for everybody. The one of David depends on what people believe to be useful for what they want to do. But if I can maybe carry on a little bit, then at least to claim some progress in protocols, at least people recently started to look at per class accuracy instead of whole image, at least now you can see which classes you get, which classes you don't get, so there is some progress. But, um, you know, if you guys want to pull out another protocol, we will all be happy to follow it. When I was a little boy and I used that argument, my mother would say to me, uh, well, if everybody else jumped in the fire, would you do it too? Yes, <laughs> and, and I would answer to my mom, um, why don't you build a better fire or switch off the fire so I don't have to jump over it? So I expect you guys to come up with a great protocol in which you can all follow, you know, there is room for progress, but I still believe the measures, they are, they give you some indication. They also, if you look at the outputs in the end, they do look like, you do see the methods that perform worse, they do label worse, even by a human judgment. No, 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 not really, no. I, I mean, everybody shows really beautiful pictures on the, in the paper, but actually if you look at the actual results, you know, for all the images, then the, 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 the results that, that look really badly, they still score of, very well. Well. So actually, I mean, we did the same thing because we had it hard to get accepted initially, and then we drew a trimap to score just right the boundary. Mm -hmm. because, uh, right. But I, I also think this is a little bit like religion because actually, yep. in absence of application, we're sort of arguing, you know, about something we don't know. So Krek and Bühler actually at NIPS had a trimap scoring as well, along with your work. So some people are moving to that scoring. Maybe you know, maybe in journal version we had a trimap version at least in honor of Alyosha. The absence of our application, I totally agree that this is becomes a, a task of it in the air. So, so you know, the absence of application, I don't think you know, you're, doing, you're committing a heinous crime. Great. So in, for what it's worth with this measure, which is at least per class and not per pixel, everybody does bad because state of the art at 29, it's pretty low, but the problem is very difficult with uh, 33 classes and such uh, small objects. Um, to conclude, yes, I I'm closing here. Uh, you want to say one more thing? No, no, no. Oh, me, okay. So to conclude, basically the point is, we are now basically at the point where the weekly supervised version, which we develop, is at a point basically around the state of the art of 2009. We are running after Lana and the future, future works. We hope to keep a three year gap behind. We will supervise this fully supervised. And we also have results on MSRC, which I believe are less interesting, but they are very analogous. Um, it's interesting also that you can beat some of the fully supervised methods with weak supervision. Um, so I skip on the evaluation of components, but believe me, you need to train alpha properly, otherwise it fails completely. And here were some failures. And one word on failures is, a lot of methods fail. But when fully supervised fails, 
they at least have the decency of getting the big surfaces right. And then forget about the windows and the doors. When we fail, well, really fail, you know, like all of a sudden the whole image is sky. <laughs> forget it. So when you face, you face more dramatically. Okay, enough failures. In conclusion, what you need to retain from this talk if you're interested as weekly supervised semantic segmentation means you don't have pixel level labels. To be effective, you will need lots of vision cues and structured models, and the two together means you need to learn these weights. You cannot do it in a standard structural output learning from weekly label data, therefore we propose a new approach with expected agreement. So, thanks for your attention. <laughs>